iPad 3 and just let you talk because you you it's very interesting everything uh, you say and of course you know your life story than better than anyone else but some things I want to come back to um, you just said a couple of minutes ago um, I wanted to be independent I wanted to pay be able to pay my own bills and of course that leads us back to your childhood your mother and your father, we are all the products of our parents, of our grandparents, etc. Um, I know your mother played a very important role in your life. And um, you, you say in your book, because I've read your book, A Signature Life, uh, that your mother, of course, uh, Sarah said it in the introduction, was a survivor of the Second World War, of the camps, the concentration camps. But you say in your book, and I wrote that down, she was uh, not a, a victim. I, I want to say that she was a survivor. Has she taught you all these values? Did she teach you all that? Yes. About I being did, independent I mean, and, and... Yes, but it, it, it's only when I was in my mid-30s, that I was in my mid-30s, that I really realized what an impact my birth was because i was born imagine a field of ashes my mother was a skeleton in a field of ashes she wasn't supposed to survive she weighed 29 kilos she couldn't survive but she did when her when she came back to brussels her parents could not believe she was she had survived but she survived her mother fed her a little bit of food every 10 minutes, and gradually she, she gained her way back. Six months later, her, her fiancé came from Switzerland, and they got married. And the doctor told them, it's fine to be married, but you can in no way have children because you won't survive, they said to my mother, and your child will not be normal. And sure enough, Nine months later. So your birth was a miracle. So my birth was a miracle. And what my mother did is she transformed mm -hmm. a, the misery into a triumph. So the day I was born, mm -hmm. I had already won. So anything that happened after that is a plus. And my mother said, fear was not an option. She never allowed me to be afraid. If I was afraid of the dark, she would lock me in a dark closet. Today, she could go to jail for that. But she gave me the best gift because she made me realize that it doesn't stay dark and that even if it is dark, why do we have to be afraid of the darkness? So I am totally the cancer to my mother's, and she also said a beautiful thing to us, to Philip, my brother and I. She said, you don't need to suffer. I suffer all of you. And that's such a wonderful, generous thing to say. She was very positive. Now she was traumatized when she was alone. It's not like she wasn't traumatized, but to us, she wanted to push us. She wanted to be independent. She used to say to me, God saves me so that I can give you life. By giving you life, you gave me my life back. You are my flambeau de liberté, torch of freedom. So I was born with a torch of freedom in my head. Now, as a little girl, freedom. it can be tough. Nice. It can be tough, right? My mother was tough. She was not easy, but I took it on. And, and I'm so happy because I was actually able to honor her and continue to honor her and, and continue to honor the fact that she, as you said before, she refused to be a victim. Mm -hmm. What about your father, Diane? What do you remember of your father and what did he teach you? <clears throat> so my father loved me. I mean, if I have to close my eyes, my father is just unconditional love. He loved me unconditionally to a point that sometimes I found it overwhelming. But because of that, I think he made my relationship with men easy. I am not a newbie. 
a needy person because my father gave me so much love that I didn't need any more. <laughs> now, uh, we all know and we know you as a beautiful, essential woman, a confident woman. Uh, you said earlier, um, I wanted to be a woman, but when you were young, people thought, this is what I read in your book, um, people thought you were a boy. Oh, only when I was very little in Belgium. You can imagine in Belgium, everybody had long straight hair with bangs and I had little dark, little, you know, curly hair and people would say, oh, quel joli petit garçon. But I mean, that was just for a short time. I don't think they think I'm a little That was guy. probably the reason why you wanted to grow up. I wanted to grow up more <laughs> now than Now then anything. you got married early. And more than anything, yes. You you got married early. You uh, arrived in New York as a young bride in, in 69. And it was clear that you had very big plans for your life more than just being a, a jet set uh, princess. What do you remember? of what was going on in your mind, in your head, at that stage of your life? <clears throat> you know, everything went so fast. Uh, before I knew, I was pregnant, married, moving to America, in that order, and, and, and started a business. I mean, had a suitcase full of dresses. I came to New York, it was a new country, it was a new language. It was a new apartment. I was married. I mean, my husband was very good looking and very this. And so I had spent a lot of time to follow behind him. But, and I had, I, at the same time, I wanted to be independent and this and that. And truly, I don't know how I did it all because I was pregnant and I would go back to the factory and make the clothes and come back and pack. It. I don't know how I did it. I kept on inventing myself. But the funny thing is, today, still today, I keep on inventing myself. And I think that part of being a woman in charge, <clears throat> which has become the umbrella of everything I do, because then when people want to say, you know, what do you want to be? I said, a woman in charge. And then they say, well, who do you dress? And I said, the woman in charge. So woman in charge is this big, huge umbrella, but to be in charge is not an aggressive statement. What it is, it's a commitment to ourselves. It's owning who we are. We own our imperfection, they become our asset. We own our vulnerability, we turn it into strength. You look so pretty in your wrap dress. Oh, this is was my, actually going to be my next question. I think there's a lot of um, wrap-up dresses, la robe portefeuille. Uh, there's actually a beautiful lady here in the second row who has the same. I have the long one. She has the short version. But I, there's another one there. So a, a lot of people are wearing these dresses. We just absolutely love them. I can't think of another dress in the world or another outfit that is so famous, you became world famous with this robe portefeuille, the wrap-up dress in, in English. Um, I thought you, in less than one year, you sold a million dresses. I heard Sarah say that it was like five million dresses. Um, when you look back at the time, were you kind of surprised of this success? Or how did you come up with that I idea mean, I, specifically? I, I know you wanted something I had no idea. I, of course, I was completely surprised of the success, but I'm even more surprised today. I mean, the idea that that dress that I created 48 years ago, right? In two years, it'd be two years, 50 years, half a century ago. And you look today in 2020 and you're beautiful and you have a great body and you feel so comfortable. <clears throat> this is completely a miracle. So it is true that I created the rap dress, but the real truth is that the dress created me. The dress gave me my independence. The, the dress a rempli mon portefeuille. The, <clears throat> the dress made me feel secure and made 
lots of women feel secure. It's one of those things that happen. It's a uniform. It's the uniform for the woman in charge. You know what's fantastic, I think, Diane, is normally if when you go to a party or you go to an event and you see another a woman with the same dress as yours, you kind of feel embarrassed. And here, I think we're all kind of happy to realize that we are we have something in common. That's also, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about that now. I wasn't going to say that's that, a nice, but I'm just thinking that's a, about that, that now because as I look at nice, you. It's a nice thing to say. I never thought about that. It's very nice. C'est comme un drapeau. It's yes. like a flag. It is a flag for freedom. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting. Um, now, of course, it became much more than, than a dress. You said it before, it's a defining power symbol for uh, women, for an influential generation of women. Um, I, I guess it, that happens gradually, not consciously, but it just happens. Uh, as everyone else, and I think that is also an important me message maybe to give today, that it was not all, uh, in Flemish we say, rose geur en maneschijn, it was not all a flower. Uh, you also had your, your setbacks, you also had your downs. Um, I think it's important to say that for women who oh, want sorry. to be entrepreneurs, who want to... Yes. Le, le, Tell us about no, the downs and how you yeah. manage to... Okay. So there is no way that things can keep on going up and better and better and better. In my case, it was so high so quickly. But then once you've dressed everyone in America, you know, then of course it's saturated. So what I think is important is to know is that you constantly have challenges, you constantly have setbacks, you constantly feel, I mean, how all of us, you wake up in the morning and you feel like a total loser. We all do. Only losers don't feel like losers, you know? It's, it's part of the questioning. But another thing that my mother told me, and that was a big lesson also, is that the setback, the things that don't work, the failures, you have to own them and then somehow you turn them into a positive that then you look back later and you say, oh my God, this happened, this good thing happened only because a bad thing happened before. So everything is a life process. You know, life is a journey and that is our destination. We are all going there and we live our life as our adventure. And what is the most important, my lesson number one that I have learned and I want to leave to everyone is that the most important relationship in life is the one we have with ourselves. Because once we have a good relationship with ourselves, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. And that is very important because you don't want to be needy. So it is important to make space for ourselves. I mean, I love solitude. I love silence because I need the solitude and I need the silence in order to think and in order to focus on my intention. What, what's the next step? How do I survive this? How do I deal with this situation? And some situations are your own and then you have world situations. So it's, be, it's really important. My, the best thing, I, I, I think the best thing that I've learned really early in my life is my relationship with myself. And, uh, and my son just called me 10 minutes ago and, and he said, how are you? And I said, I'm good. And I said, you know what? I'm so happy I am me. And he laughed. And he understands because I think he's happy with him too. And, and, but it's not narcissism. It's really kind of taking the responsibility of who you are and trying to be the best person you can mm -hmm. for yourself. 
so many interesting uh, things you are saying right now. Um, I was going to make a, a comparison with what Nelson Mandela said about I either win or I learn. This is in another way also what you're oh, saying like is let's not talk about failure, like let's talk about experiences. I like that. Either yes. I win <laughs> or I learn. I love that. The, or I favorite, learn, yeah. My, my favorite thing about Nelson Mandela is the fact that he went, he was, he was in jail for 26 years and he spent time learning the language of the people who put him to jail so he could speak to them. But when he came out, he said his first words was, as I was saying 26 years before that, I love that. He's my idol. <laughs> Um, okay, Sarah said it into an, in the introduction, you did not do what you wanted to do, but who you wanted to be, right? This is also one of the most important messages that you want to uh, transmit to women. B do or be what you want to be, think about what you want to be and go for it, right? Yeah, and and it's not like I did not know what I mean. It's not like I wanted to be an architect or I wanted to be a fashion designer. I didn't know, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be, and and I became that woman. And fashion ended up being my my thing. And what? But even my fashion, you know, my fashion is really uniform. You know, it's uniform. There are two things that inspire me: woman and nature. So the woman is about the silhouette, it's about the body language. What makes a woman beautiful is eye contact, smile, and body language. And my dresses understand body language. And then nature has an influence on me because I am in the business of print. I, I create uniform that people are comfortable in, but they want new things and new colors. And, and so, Obviously, uh, nature is a very big inspiration. Okay, you now you, uh, through your career, you wrote several books, and one of them, it's an older one, but I want to talk about it. It's the Book of Beauty, and the subtitle is How to Become a More Attractive, a More Confident, and a More Sensual Woman. Now, of course, we all want to know how do we become that? Well, it is crazy. The fact that I wrote that book, I was 28. Of course you're beautiful at 28. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But the reason I bought that book, I wrote that book, is because I was developing a cosmetic line, a makeup line. And as I was learning all the tricks about beauty, I wrote about it. That's, that's what usually I do. I, even when I was at school, when I learned, when I was trying to learn my lesson for an exam, I would pretend in, alone in my room that I was the teacher in front of a blackboard and explaining it because when I hear myself say it, that's when I learn. So how to be, I don't know. I mean, it's crazy that I even did that book. But I, but you know, the funny thing about me is that I have been basically a, an, an adult for 50 years, for half a century, and I've repeated the same thing over and over and over. And sometimes it drives people crazy, but I see interviews that I did when I was 28, interviews that I did 20 years ago and now, and it's always been the same, the same thing. But 50 years later, you look back and you think, oh, that's some consistency. So I was very happy that I have used words and explaining words and explaining my feeling. I've used that as, as, as my roadmap to learn. Um, and uh, because, you know, at first, when I first arrived in New York and I was a young princess and people would interview me, and then they had this vision of me, of this, I don't know, Park Avenue princess, which was absolutely not who I was. So that's when I kind of took over and, and I became a little provocative. Provocative is something that I like to be because it, it, 
to be provocative uh, provokes, you know, interesting interest and interesting things. And I became provocative. And so, of course, they had to write that. But at least the narrative of what they wrote was not their opinion of me, it was what I said. So to own your own words is incredibly important. Uh, the last book I did, which is Own It, which is like a little dictionary, I did that during COVID, is really explain the power of words. I think what words are so powerful. You have to use them so carefully because they do create energy. You're taking the words right out of my mouth because I was uh, headed here in my hands and I was going to talk about it, but that's exactly what my question was and it's exactly what I wanted to uh, put the emphasis on. Now, I don't know what time it is. I would like to talk a little bit before giving the opportunity to the audience to also ask some questions about your philanthropy. I know you're uh, an active philanthropist these days. You sit on the board of Vital Voices. Now, can you tell us briefly a little bit more about that organization? So Vital Voices is a network. It's a global network. Of, uh, it started so that you know, it started that in the UN 25 years ago, uh, uh, had the first conference of women leader in Beijing. And they invited a women's leader from 186 countries. And when I talk about women's leaders, I'm not talking about prime ministers, but I'm talking about grassroots leaders. I wasn't there, but apparently it was the most extraordinary event. Uh, Hillary Clinton was then first lady, and she went, and that's when she made her famous speech, um, women's right are human's right. Anyway, it was very exciting, and going back to, the, to America, she looked at her chief of staff and she said, we can't let this energy go in. And they created something called Vital Voices, which at first was go government and now is a nonprofit. And it is basically a global network for bad ass women in 186 countries. And it's an amazing, an amazing network of women. And it's incredibly inspiring. And next week, we bought a beautiful building in Washington, D.C., and we will have um, a building which will be the first global embassy for women. Okay. You also serve as director of the Diller uh, Family Foundation? Yes, we have a family foundation for our family, and we are all directors. I'm also on the board of the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. Uh, on the board of the Film Academy Museum. And uh, yeah, but you know, philanthropy is, is something that you grow into. It's a little bit like uh, landscaping, you know, when you first get a country, you're afraid to plant anything because you don't know, and then you get used to it. And then you see what you plant. And in a sense, uh, uh, philanthropy is very much like that. At first, you know, for me, philanthropy was working in a hospital, and I, I couldn't do that. But philanthropy is just caring and 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 helping, and and it's the most enriching thing we can do. Now, then, if you would uh, do it, or you would have to do it all over again, you have uh, received so many awards. Is there something that you would do, do differently? You know, I think you only regret the things you don't do. And I think I did all the things that I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't always do them perfectly or whatever. I mean, you know, there's no, no such thing as perfection. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. What would I tell? People always say, what would you tell your 18-year-old uh, person? I would just tell her to trust herself and that she would do it, as I did. While writing a book, um, 
I don't know if it was you who said it. Yeah, I think it was you. You said something like, um, I try to define myself to myself. Um, now, if you would have to paint a self-portrait, so a portrait of yourself, what would it look like? Um, I think there would be a heart, a big heart, for sure. Uh, um, hmm. I think there would be life. It wouldn't be perfect, it would be lives. I think it's life and love um, and, and respect for life and, and, and the best way to respect life is by giving love. And, and giving love is what matters. Receiving love is just a sidekick. I think the important thing is what we do. Um, you know, and not what we get. I feel very grateful and very honored to um, to interview you today because I also feel that you have a lot to teach us and you have an enormous positive inner strength. So I, I want to thank you uh, for that. Um, it's not finished yet because um, if you allow us, I would like to give uh, the opportunity to the audience to also maybe uh, ask uh, you some questions. So I don't know how we're going to do that. I don't. I don't know if you need a microphone. Are there other? Ah, yes, there is a microphone there. Can I say so, something? So um, can I? Can who I wants say to be the first? Can I say something before? Yes, of course. It's not. Ju it's not just me who has inner strength. All women have their inner strength. I have never met a woman who is not strong. They don't exist. But very often, they hide it because of a husband or a brother or mm -hmm. a father or religion or whatever. They don't want to show their strength. And then there's a tragedy. And in front of tragedy, women come out. Their strength come out. They take one child, two child, a third, and they go. So, I am just a sample of women, and but all women are strong. That's nice to hear that. Um, so, who wants to be the first one? Qui va être le premier ou la prière? Première. Yes, there in the one, two, three, four, five, six row. Um, thank you so much for the talk, and I think that everything we learned about being successful was very inspiring. <laughs> but I'd like to ask you, how do you deal with failures or disappointments? What are your mechanisms for going past that? All right. Uh, the first thing about failure is that you just have to accept it. That's why I call this book own. You have to accept it. You don't fight it. Okay, I fail. Fine. So how? what do I do next? I mean, your failure is not the end. It's probably the beginning of something else. So challenges and failure, it's, it's not failure. You go to the next thing, you know? Um, I don't know. I, I, that's the way my mother was. And, and because you know, you know the, the, you never know. I will give you the biggest, the most horrific example, all right? My mother is arrested because she does resistance. She's arrested in, in Brussels. She goes to Malines. From Malines, she goes to Auschwitz. She spends four days in the train in the worst condition. And she becomes very good friend with this woman who is with her. And that woman speaks a little German. So my mother decides, no matter what happened, I never leave this woman, right? So they arrive, but they're dirty and they're disgusting. There's a big line. And there's a soldier that say, you go right, you go left, you go right, you go left. Behind the soldier on an elevated podium 
There's a man dressed in white and he doesn't move. So when time comes to my mother's friend, the soldiers say, you go right. My mother, without being told what to do, she follows her and he lets her go. The man of a higher rank who has not moved this entire time comes down, takes my mother, white, whips her and throws her on the other side. And she fell on the floor and she looked at him with so much hate. She said to me, I never hated anyone so much. Why, why did this man do to me? Well, it turns out that this man was a horrible person. He was Joseph Mengele, who people call the angel of death. But you know what? He actually saved my mother from going to the gas chamber. So you never know. So the big lesson of this is that she would tell me always, you never know. Something that you think is the worst thing for you may be your safe. So I know that's very dramatic. I mean, you just want such a dramatic story. No, but it's... But I have used that story so many times when friends complain to me about trivial, unimportant things that they had failed. And it immediately puts everything back in perspective. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Next question. Yes, there on the other side. Uh, maybe, yes. Thank you so much for this uh, inspiring talk. Um, speaking about inspiration, where do you get your creative inspiration for your prints and your dresses? Nature, 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 nature. I take pictures of nature every single day of my life. I have hundreds of thousands because in nature, you know Leonardo da Vinci, who is my biggest I don't. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a genius, right? He, he was a genius. Not only was a painter and a sculptor, but he was an inventor. And he invented the helicopter and the scuba diving and all of this thing. Of all of his achievement, Leonardo, the one thing he was the proudest of is that he could read nature. Because he said that in nature, you find everything, every mathematical formula, every answer, every design is in nature. Next one, yes, here in the one, two, three, fourth row, on my left here, the lady with the same dress as me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, the, the choice of the dress today was because I think this was the, your first pattern, but I may be wrong. The chain was the first iconic dress in history. So that was the reason for me wearing it today. It felt like a great privilege meeting you and, and of course using this. But my question to you would be, what would be your advice? What advice would you give to yourself as a little girl so to the little girl if you went back to that time having looked back at what has been your life in the meantime what would be your I advice would, to the little girl version of yourself i would tell her to do what i did to write her diary i have written my diary all my life because for me writing in my diary was 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 finding the friendship with myself and the complicity with myself. I could tell my diary everything. And so, and, and, and what I would tell the little girl is trust yourself. Trust yourself, but also be true to yourself. Don't pretend you are something you're not. Really go deep and accept who you are, the good, the, what you like and what you don't like. Try to improve yourself. But to be true to yourself and to be your best friend is the only advice I can give you. And I, the best advice I ever heard that got from anyone is a man whose grandmother survived the genocide in Armenia. And she said to this little boy, they were refugees, he said, you know, the only thing that you have complete control of is your character. 
You could lose your health. You could lose your wealth. You could lose your family. You could lose your beauty. You could lose your freedom. But you never lose your character, even under torture. And that, to me, is the most powerful thing to know. Because your character ends up being this little house inside yourself that is your shelter where you go and look for protection. Your, the protection you can have is only inside yourself. Yes. I mean, you know what it means to me? I have to tell you, I was a little Belgian girl, right? I wanted to get out of Belgium so badly because when I was a little girl in Belgium, I thought nothing would ever happen to me. I had the most boring life and it was always raining. And look, so many years later, I am back talking to all of you in Belgium and I realized that Belgium is not boring that Belgium is full of creative people. And that I was lucky to be born in Belgium because the more it rained, the more it made my imagination work. Well, today, no, not one cloud is in the sky. Not one, it's blue sky. So that's another good thing. Yes, go ahead. Yes, and actually being a Brussels girl, having worked for DVF, uh, for four years here in Brussels. Um, you've inspired me personally um, to be strong. Um, my question to you is, what is your advice uh, on women here in 2022, um, still facing gender inequality in different levels? Um, what would you advise them or give tips to them to be strong still today? Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Hello? It's kind of symbolic. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what I would, advise, uh, I would advise is that uh, <sighs> I dare to be you. Just dare to be you. I mean, I think the, the, I think the world will be saved by women. And I think when you see all the violence, I mean, who are those women who will go to war like that. Who are the women who will, I mean, this is just not a woman thing. Women give life, create, give life. So I think that the more women could be aligned and, and strong and not be afraid of their own strength, the better it is. Step by step, be the change you want to see in the world. It was Gandhi who said that. That's also maybe something to always keep in mind. There was another question there. Yes, um, I was going to ask you, but you started to, to talk about Belgium yourself, but uh, you were born here. And I was wondering how much uh, you took with you from your European roots, uh, from your Belgian roots, and how does it make you different today, but throughout your whole career, um, because you are now in America, and I suppose that you, you, you are different. Uh, is it because of your roots? Do you think that makes you a bit different? Yes, I, th I think your roots, I think your roots, take a picture. I think your roots are very, very important. My roots, I, was, I went to school in Cédage Bay, or uh, Sablon, uh, uh, I love my school and my mother, my mother went to the same school. So both my mother and I, and what I, I found out only late is that she, at the end there was the war. And because she was Jewish, she was supposed to, she, she couldn't go back, continue to go to school. But Mademoiselle Gillet, who was the headmaster, uh, headmistress, they forced her to stay. And then, she was arrested. And then a few years later, the little girl of this woman, of this girl, she was a little girl. And I, I went to the same school and we had the same headmistress. And that's when the Lucidash Bay celebrated its 75th birthday, my age today. And they chose me to blow the candle. It was a big, huge uh, cake. And they choose me, the little curly hair girl, 
to blow the candle. And that was the first day that I was on the cover of Le Soir. J'étais sur la couverture du soir. And, and I never understood until very recently why they picked me, the ugliest of the little girls that they had, to blow the candle. But now I realize that it was a symbol for the headmistress, that I was the child of a girl who had been prisoner of war and who came home. Another one? Yes? So thanks very much uh, for sharing all these um, lessons of life with all of us. So thanks very much. And I also wanted to raise up, I mean, that uh, your professional career has been very impressive throughout all these years. So um, I just wanted to ask you, what is your reflection of what do you add to the fashion world after all these years? And also, if you think that with COVID, um, the fashion sector has evolved somehow, or what have you learned, and how have things been evolving regarding this? Okay, so years? I think I think my contribution to the fashion world is I have created a uniform, and I personally love uniforms. Because uniform, you see, the difference between art and design is that design is utilitarian, right? So the great thing about uniforms is the pockets are in the right place, the thing, because they are uniform. The most beautiful design, anything, design handbag, usually came from a hunting bag or, because it's utilitarian. So I guess that I make, I like the idea that I make uniform for the woman in charge, meaning they're, little, they're your friends in your closet and they help you feel good about yourself, show yourself, be good, be comfortable. It has all the little tricks of dressmaking that will you know, hide your stomach or do this or do that, but they are friends and they become part of who you are. They don't take over your personality, they enhance your personality. And, and uh, because I am very practical, my best design ideas have always been when I pack a suitcase. Because if you know how to pack, you know how to live. And I pack every three days. Ah, people like the packing. It's it's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice, Diane, to have all these people asking questions because I spend a lot of hours on stage, and often when there's a questions and answer, you know, it's it's not always that easy. People don't dare to ask their questions, and here it's really um, impressive how you all uh, all have want to have your say and all you want to share your your questions and your thoughts. Um, I don't know what the time is. Uh, I look at the organizers. Do we have to close this off or what's the time? Anyone can tell me what the time is? Five past eight. So unless somebody really says, I can't leave this room without asking this question, uh, there's one lady. So that's then the last one or is there another urge in the room? No? Okay, that lady here on the one, two, three, fourth row in the middle. And that will be the last question. Hi, um, I have a question. I would like to know what would be your advice because I am creating my own brand and I would, I'm 28, so when you wrote your first uh, book, and I will have an advice from you, like how to believe in yourself if you have also people in your Entourage, Sur surrounding, yeah, surrounding, uh, telling you you're not enough. You know, like an advice, just to be like to believe in yourself. Okay, my first advice to you, you know what it is? Look at yourself in the mirror, and 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 say that if I doubt my power, I give power to my doubts. 
Thank you. Mais vous êtes tellement belle. What's that? I didn't hear that. Did I said she's so beautiful. Thank you very much um, again, Diane, for spending uh, this time uh, with us. Uh, we could go on for hours and hours. Uh, let us know when you come. I don't know if you come to Belgium now and then, but we would really like to know. And yes, uh, we wish oh, you a lot I, of I, uh, luck. Yes, no, absolutely. I love to come to Belgium now. And, uh, and you know, I, uh, next time you all eat a chocolat Côte d'Or, you think of me. And, uh, and uh, I'm very proud to be Belgian. And I am very happy, actually, that um, Belgium welcomed my parents and that I was born there. And my brother was born there. And uh, it was a very good beginning of life. And, um, and thanks to my sister-in-law, Greta, who opened the EBF Brussels, uh, she's the one who brought me to Belgium in honor, you know? I, and uh, so it's a, very, uh, it's a very special thing. Thank you again for all the inspiration you give to women and you have been giving, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more uh, of you. Thank you very much, Diane von Furstenberg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.